Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, my name's Stuart Clark. I'm the editor of TBI. Let's do some quick advertising. Please pick one up. It's, wow. it's really good. Um, <laughs> but more importantly, I'm joined by uh, JB Perret, who is the president of Discovery Networks International. So the international part of Discovery Communications, which now accounts for over half of the company's revenues. Um, it's doing lots of interesting things, moving into new areas. Um, we, we really do have a lot to talk about, I think, in this session. But before we get into that, there's a Discovery video that shows uh, some, some of the things that they do. So if we can have a look at that, please. I think, um, I think JB, that's quite... people applaud to that. Started by our Discovery fans. It's quite, um, that's quite a long sizzle reel. However, there's quite a lot that the company does, right? So 30 years ago, it was built as a classic pay TV business, that dual revenue stream of affiliate fees from the operators and advertising, but it's become much more. At what point did you realize or make the decision that you needed to move into, for example, free TV and now into OTT? Well, look, I think the evolution of the company, and it's interesting, we live at a time right now where obviously there's a lot of evolution going on, a lot of changes going on in the media landscape. And when you think about it, 30 years ago, to the credit of the founders of the company and the board of the company uh, who have been uh, with the company for the last 30 years and continue to be our major shareholders, they, uh, they were, we were frankly the disruptors of the broadcast business, right? Um, and so uh, we came about, they started with one network in one country, um, and now we wake up 30 years later uh, with an average of 10 networks um, across 220 countries. We started with one uh, channel. Uh, we now have you know, over 50 uh, channel brands. We now have, we started out as a nonfiction male focused uh, content company and we now are really a multi-genre uh, media company. And so, um, Look, I, I've had the the, uh, the 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 pleasure and the and the frankly the uh, uh, the fun of taking this international business uh, and working with a great set of leaders around the world, and many of whom are here uh, to try and grow the business further. But the evolution of the company started 30 years ago, and frankly, hasn't stopped. Uh, that evolution will continue. And now, as you said, we went from pay TV as a model to pay TV plus free to air plus pay TV plus free to air at OTT. And that model of multi-platform models, pay, free, subscription OTT, we think is a pretty compelling model uh, for years to come. And the evolution of percentages of where the geography of that business shifts is going to evolve. But we like the three businesses. Streaming and, and OTT are, are real buzzwords. People in the industry are, are getting to grips with how to have content in new platforms, launch channels and content in, in new ways. Tell us about what you're doing in the OTT space for those who are not familiar. So we, we, uh, we've relaunched in, in 2015 two products primarily. Uh, number one is a sports product uh, with our Eurosport acquisition about 15 months ago when we took control of Eurosport and then we just closed last week on the 100% uh, ownership of Eurosport. Um, and uh, we relaunched the Eurosport uh, Player, which is an OTT product where you get, you know, if you're a tennis fan and you're watching the US Open, uh, obviously you'll get the two primary court feeds on Eurosport 1 and 2. Um, but if you want, you know, to watch the eight courts or the ten courts that are playing in the early rounds, uh, you can go to the player and you can get access to everything. And so uh, we've got the Eurosport Player, which is available across Europe uh, in 50 countries around Europe. Uh, direct to consumer, and then in the Nordics, uh, we launched something called DPlay, which is a subscription product which aggregates all of our uh, big broadcast content across the old SBS networks plus our discovery content into one offering that is available direct to consumer, uh, and we launched that again this year across those markets. And, and and to be clear, is this done in conjunction with your pay TV operator partners as they launch? OTT services, or is this you taking your content direct to the consumer? So I think there's a couple things to remember. Number one is a lot of the product offerings, first of all, we also make available clearly to our distribution partners. So uh, we have a product, for example, with, uh, with Eurosport, Eurosport 360, which is essentially the equivalent of the player uh, offered uh, via our affiliates. So we never want to be in a position where somehow we're disadvantaging our affiliate partners um, versus what's in the market. Um, so we, we do that, number one. Number two is 
look, we, like our affiliates, all see the world evolving um, to this multi-screen world, and we're all trying to figure out how to get the consumers what they want. Um, and uh, we'll partner with the affiliate to do it, we'll do it as well, and right now we're seeing that work rather well. The reality is also, particularly for sports, uh, you take events like the Australian Open, which we have uh, on Eurosport in, uh, in January, uh, the, the, the matches are all played just because of time zones across Europe in the daytime. And so people generally are not home. And so we are seeing a lot of subscriptions coming from people who otherwise wouldn't have access to it. But when given the preference, they prefer to watch it on the biggest screen they have, which is usually in their home. But when they don't have access to it, they're happy to pay uh, you know, a couple euros a month to get access to it on all their devices. And, and I think you, you've said that you hope to have a million OTT customers within a relatively short space of time. In the next two years, uh, we've set out the, the goal of having uh, a million subscribers. We've got a couple hundred thousand today. Um, across seen, across D-Play and Across D-Play Eurosport and Eurosport Play. Player. Uh, and we see, look, the reality is, particularly as we're investing more in uh, a couple key rights, uh, and as we're investing more in the actual product itself, uh, we've seen significant growth monthly uh, since we really relaunched and pushed these products out in the beginning of the year. And, and JB, for, for the producers in the room and, and others, Will you, will your programming teams be commissioning? Will there be original content on the uh, the D Play service, or is it more about using some of the great stuff you've made in the past and giving people a chance to Look, see? I, it? I think it's an evolution. You know, we're obviously still small, uh, and so we're primarily commissioning still for uh, you know what we'd call television, mm. um, and we're still the primary elements of the business and making that available on these screens. Are we commissioning directly for those platforms? Not today. However, in the sports world, we are uh, partnering on certain rights that will potentially only be available on the player. Um, and so I think that is something that is, uh, is going to evolve, but you've got to sort of pace that with the scale of the business before we sort of put a lot of more original content then, on those then, platforms. JB, key, key to the, the DNI business is the pay TV component. That's still huge. Um, and the thing that pay TV platform, the operators fear the most is cord cutting, is people leaving their service for a, a cheaper OTT product. How can you have that and also not uh, cause friction with your, your long-term partners? Well, I, I think there's a couple of things. First of all, on a pure value, at the end of the day, when you think about cord cutting, etc., a lot of it comes down to economics. The value of the bundle uh, is still by far the most cost-efficient way to get the breadth of content that's in the offering. So we're in no way putting that at risk because at the end of the day, we aren't packaging 100 channels and putting that together for a, uh, a good offering. We're not making that available on a multi-platform basis. So that's not our model. Our model is for the specialists, for the super fans, for the people who want, again, additional content coverage of sports who can't get access to it in, the, uh, in their place, uh, whether they're working, whether it's something else, we'll provide access to them because I think we're in a world where, look, this is something that we're in constant conversation with our distributors. The world where we lose as an industry is ultimately where we don't satisfy the consumer needs. Where we're trying to figure out is with them, ourselves, how do we do it and provide them what they want, but without ultimately, uh, uh, you know, obviously hurting, as you said, the, the core of our business, which remains pay TV. And, and how, how, can, how can these services coexist with fairly, well, in this world, established and big players such as you know, Netflix and Amazon? In, in, do you envisage that people will have a D-Play subscription and a Eurosport player subscription as well as? What, what, how does the consumer Look, embrace I, this? Honestly, I, there are a lot more questions than, than answers to those right now. And we don't pretend, uh, we're, we're, we're humble enough to believe that we don't know. Uh, what we do know is obviously the viewers want access. And so what we have to do as an industry is figure out a way to deliver that access. And so uh, we do think that you know, our, our business has been built on 30 years of delivering very clear brand propositions and targeting great content to serve that super fan. Uh, and we believe that those super fans exist uh, and they may not be you know, uh, measured in the you know, billions, uh, but they are significant. And so whether the world moves to everything, there is actually massive power in aggregation, clearly. Um, so there'll be an aggregation play. Whether the, the aggregation play is the only offering that works 
or whether there's these thematic packages around sports, around science, around nonfiction, um, I think is something that, you know, they're still, we're still very early in that evolution. And you guys made a, a very big bet on sports by buying Eurosport and buying the remainder, I think, the deal that closed perhaps last, just last week. And that all looks like it went to the next level when earlier this year you bought the rights to the Olympics for 2018 to 24, I think. What does, what does that bring to the business? What was the rationale behind that? Yeah, so, so look, uh, a couple things. Number one is uh, about 50% of Eurosports content today is Olympic sports. So it's cycling, it's winter sports, it's track and field. So in a way, uh, if we're going to be, you know, kind of the home of Olympic sports, which in a sense, many ways, Eurosport already is today, uh, having uh, the equivalent of sort of the, the build up to the Olympics, but without having the final sort of big, uh, big match in the Olympics was a miss. And so we felt like it was a perfectly complimentary right to say we can actually do now the road to gold uh, and take you through the stories uh, throughout the year and build up to the final crescendo in the Olympics. That was one piece. The other piece is, look, the Olympics are a unique right. I mean, they're, they're the biggest uh, global event that exists. They are about not just sports, but they're actually about human stories. And we are a company that's all been built on human stories. And so we love the content makeup uh, to be able to tell stories, not just during the Olympics, but throughout the year. And then the third thing is, uh, look, it's in the sports business, as we are you know, fairly new still to that, um, it's hard in a lot of these rights where you, know, you pay a lot of money, uh, you get them for three years, and then you, you're back at the table. Uh, and so for us who are brand builders and franchise builders, partnering with the Olympics, which is already such, you know, arguably the biggest and, and best brand in, in, in the world, um, to take it for 10 years and be able to actually build our businesses and their business around that uh, gives us a long-term trajectory to be actually able to partner with them. And, and then you will also be uh, selling the rights to third parties. So we have, we, we obviously, uh, look, our commitment, what, our, what excites us about it is being able to actually broadcast and tell the stories in a different way that's never been told before. We want to reach more people than we ever have in Europe. Um, and so part of that will be a, a partnership of what do we put on Eurosport, what do we put on our Eurosport player, and what do we make available on free to air, which clearly there are Olymp IOC requirements, but there also are uh, local regulations in every market about what needs to be on free to air. And we obviously are you know, fully cognizant of those and will comply, and we'll do that on our own networks in some markets, um, where we have free to air networks, and then we will do that on, uh, through partners and others. And I think a crucial part of that deal was this is not just TV rights, is it? We're going into what could arguably be the first multi-platform Olympics. Yeah, I think, look, the evolution of what's going to happen in 2020, 2022, 2024, given the speed of change, is frankly almost impossible to really contemplate today. But Discovery, you know, part of our brand essence in Discovery and also part of what we, who we are is believing that we want to be on the cutting edge of new technology. So we were, you know, early to obviously first to pay, to pay TV as a whole. We were first to HD. We, f we were first to 3D, even though that never really kind of evolved to what we, anybody thought it was. What will, full, what will 4K be? Will well, 4K look, be 4K, 3? same thing. We're doing a lot of investment into 4K. Uh, and our content, look, our content looks best closest to real, right? Uh, and so the more that all these technologies bring you closer to real, we think our, our content is uniquely positioned to uh, play well in those arenas. And we just launched a virtual reality uh, app um, about uh, um, you know, a few weeks ago. And um, that's another version. You know, can you imagine you know, doing, uh, by 2020 or 2022, uh, doing uh, the virtual Olympics? Um, you know, it, there's enormous amount of opportunities, particularly in sports, to be able to bring technology uh, to the forefront and make it really work in a new and creative ways for and, the programming. And you, you were first out with HD, or you were at the forefront with HD, same with 3D, which didn't, just didn't work in the way that a lot of people expected for anyone. What, what are the prospects for 4K and you might expect Discovery being a leader in the, these matters to have a 4K channel soon? Look, we're first investing in, in 4K content because obviously that's the, 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 uh, the building blocks. 
Um, and, and then eventually we'll continue to explore what the opportunities are to make, uh, you know, whether, and, and that's a conversation that obviously we have constantly with our distribution partners and others in the ecosystem. And of course, ultimately, it all comes down to content, doesn't it? It's all about programming and storytelling, which is why we're very fortunate to be joined by Marjorie Kaplan, who will come to the stage in a second, who is Discovery's, um, as Discovery pushes more into content from the international markets, it is moving to a new stage, hopefully, with Marjorie relocating to London. So Marjorie, if you can join us on stage. I'll say two words on Marjorie just as she's coming up, you know, um, and, uh, you know, we, we in the international business spent about a billion dollars on content, um, and that number was probably 10% of that five years ago. Uh, so we've massively increased our investment in, in content uh, internationally. And uh, our model for 30 years of discovery was very much driven by one pillar, which was develop in the United States, export to the world, uh, language reversion to make the content as local as possible. But I think in the world that, again, everyone here knows as well as I do, uh, great creative ideas are coming from everywhere. Uh, and what we want to do is we think about sort of the next 30 years of discovery is take the model of, uh, you know, uh, develop in the U.S. and take everywhere around the world and really move it to a model of develop locally, wherever that is, and take it globally or regionally. And having someone like Marjorie, who is a, not only a veteran of discoveries, but an incredible creative leader, uh, and uh, come join us in the international team, be based out of London, and be able to help all of our international teams around the world find the best creative ideas and figure out how do we supersize them in some cases uh, and then take them around the world is incredibly exciting for us. So uh, I'm thrilled. Marjorie, you, you have, uh, we've just heard uh, a, a billion dollars to spend on programming. That's pretty much the most popular person in Cannes. I don't think you're not, you're not gonna get out of this room uh, in one piece. Um, and I know you're less than a week into the job. Right? Two, yeah, this is my second day. This is your second day. Yeah. So what, what do you have to announce? No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> What, what, what is the challenge? What do you see as you relocate from the States to London to the international base? It's super early days, of course, but how do you see the challenge and, and I would like to how say that the biggest it? challenge at the moment is that I know that my face is projected up there, like bigger than, I mean, I'm standing back there <laughs> looking at you guys projected and thinking, oh my God, I'm gonna have to Don't look, look out backwards, there. <laughs> um, Look, I think the, the, I think the biggest challenge is in this world where people are watching television differently, where you're not just you know, competing with what's on tonight, but you're competing with what's on, been on the last you know, 40 years of television, um, plus all the things that you can get at your fingertips. Um, I think the biggest challenge is, you know, what do you do that can really make a difference? Um, what, how can we think about how we invest in content, how we are creative partners, um, what's gonna really matter region by region, and then how we can build that together into something that can be global. Um, it's a you know, hugely, it's a daunting and exciting prop proposition. And it's, it's interesting to see how, the pro how programming has evolved across Discovery because originally would have been docs and now goes right through to scripted. For international, is, what, what part does, would scripted have to play, do you think? Drama. Well, look, it's early days. I mean, I think one easy answer is we have free-to-air channels that are running scripted now, that are airing scripted now. And so taking a look at how we think about scripted across those businesses, and then whether there's a, a strategy that plays kind of all around the world, I think is um, uh, it's certainly something we'd have to look at and, and, and an exciting prospect. And, and in the world of uh, nonfiction, of uh, unscripted, certainly at the reality end, there's been in the past, I guess, 12 months, you know, some, some notable execs, some discovery, standing up and saying that perhaps things were a little too structured, uh, a degree of authenticity had been lost. As a, as a trend, is that something that, that you, you observed as well? Yeah, look, I mean, I think, you know, JB was talking about it as it relates to how people watch television. You have to follow the audience. And uh, I think there's no question we hear, we do a lot of focus groups, we do a lot of research with people, we all watch television ourselves, and we know how we feel about this kind of derivative content. It's the business that we're in, the entertainment business is, you know, something works and everybody runs right after what works. That's normal, that's not surprising, but it can get old pretty quickly. Um, I think one of the really interesting challenges is that the there are still an awful lot of people watching that content. So we know we need to migrate to something that feels fresher and feels newer. Um, and the question becomes, you know, how do you do it without leaving behind the people who are still there? Uh, but 
And I think there's some exciting examples of that. And, and I guess the one thing I would say, you know, speaking to an audience of people who are, many of them creators, is I think one root is creator-driven content, is really thinking about not cookie cutter content, but having a strong creative voice. We talk in scripted a lot about creator driven content. Mm -hmm. We talk about you know the voice of the writer, um, but there's been very little conversation about creator driven nonfiction, and I think that's an exciting way to think about how we can evolve. So that it's not just sort of broadly, you know, well it has to be more authentic. That's not a terribly meaningful direction, um, but I think there's opportunity to, to be much more creative in how we think but about in it. In terms of creativity, Discovery also has. Uh, Betsy and Raw and Stable, um, all three media, and, and it's all of those production companies that, that sit under that umbrella. I mean, they were all independent and had that kind of independent, kind of creative spirit. It, mm. does, does it not stifle that to some extent when you become part of what is, you know, a huge and successful, but cor uh, more corporate environment, perhaps? Right. Have we ground them down? I didn't want to put it like audience? that, Marjorie. I, I think they would, they would protest. <laughs> Look, I mean, the, yeah, the question is best put to them because the reality is, I mean, I can tell you strategically the imperative when we did those deals was exactly the opposite, which is ultimately very important for them to remain independent, for them to feel like they could produce for us, they could produce for others, and that the creative teams there could be truly, you know, feeling like, you know, they're led by their ideas, their visions, and then ultimately trying to take them uh, wherever it made best, most sense. And I think, and Marjorie you know, can comment on it as well, but I think generally, you, if you ask them, they'd say, it's been fantastic. And if anything, we've given them you know, more capital, more funds to try and go out and do bigger ideas, and we've tied them in where appropriate to our creative teams more closely to try and generate new ideas and bring, you know, sort of accelerate the time from idea to production in a more meaningful way when it makes sense for our networks. Yeah. And, and uh, I, know, I know we've got uh, Racing Extinction to have a, have a quick look at. We're, we're running low on time, but I know we're going to have a look at that. Uh, what, t tell us about that show. What, what's interesting? Because I know it's also being released internationally on the same day across kind of 200 plus countries, right? Right. I mean, so look, what's, what's exciting about Racing Extinction is a couple of different things. First of all, it's important. You know, Discovery's a purpose driven company, it's a Sundance. It was, you acquired it from, uh, it was at Sundance, it was, it wasn't was it? It was at Sundance. It's produced it's by Luis Sohoyos. Pardon me? I was just saying, for the people who don't know it, oh, it's yes. a one-off film. Yes, it's a fantastic film um, from the uh, Oscar-winning um, uh, director of um, The Cove, um, Luis Sohoyos. Uh, and it is about the state of the oceans, the planet. Um, and uh, you know, it has a very important message, but it's very powerful storytelling. Um, and Discovery got behind it in a way that only Discovery can. I mean, we're a global company. I, I literally, I don't think there's ever been anything that's been released on the same day all around the world. And what's particularly unique about this is because we wanted to do it on the same day all around the world, it starts in New Zealand. So this is not a film that's gonna premiere in the United States and make its way around. It starts in New Zealand and it literally follows the sun uh, all the way, or I guess maybe follows the setting sun all the way around the world. Uh, and we'll kick off a campaign. Um, uh, to be focused on, on you know, creating action around an, an important issue. And I think just to add to it, it, it is, as Marjorie said, we, we are a purpose-driven company. As much as we are entertainment, obviously, we are ultimately trying to do, when we're at our best, entertainment content that informs and enlightens uh, and creates a conversation. And this is truly one that is com you know, massively conversation-worthy. I think also, you know, in this world of change and evolving, we still believe that uh, you know, in, ironically, in a world of proliferating choice, strong brands really matter. Uh, and they really matter as curated beacons for people in a world of infinite choice who are increasingly lost about where do I go. And uh, it's something that is very core to us, which is Discovery and, and certainly Rich Ross and his team as he's come on board uh, has, uh, has gotten back to really trying to make clear that Discovery is about purpose-driven content. Um, and, you know, this is a there's no better example of, of okay, that. That's the, the, can, can we play the, the racing extinction clip, please? Okay, we, we really have run out of time, but just one <laughs> final question, if I can. Uh, JB, I've been writing about Discovery for, for some years, and if you'd asked me, if someone asked me what Discovery was when I started out, I'd have said it's a documentary channel. Mm. You know, that, that's what it was back then. Today we've talked about free TV, OTT, big family of channels. 
What is discovery in 2015? I, I think it's less about pigeonholing what we are today and more describing on the journey we're on. And for us, the journey, I think, is one where we want to be a leader in global entertainment on all screens. And to us, you know, I'm not sure there'll be a day where we wake up and say, we're there. But that's, that's what we're striving towards. That's the evolution of one channel to many channels. That's the evolution of one market to many markets. That's the evolution of one model of pay to multiple models of pay and free. That's the evolution of one content genre to multiple content genres. And that evolution, you know, we're probably uh, still, I don't know, somewhere in the middle of the journey. Okay, good stuff. Uh, we've run over, but thank you. Um, thank you for coming along. I mean, we covered lots of ground. Um, please join me in saying thanks very much to JB Perrett and Marjorie Kaplan.